Access to Democracy is made possible by donations from the following organizations. Thomson Reuters, a global company with expertise and insight to unravel complex situations in the areas of law, tax, compliance, government, and media. Their worldwide network of journalists and editors keep customers up to speed on relevant global events. Crutchfield Dermatology, a full-service treatment center and medispa in Egan. Their goal is to help you look good and feel great with beautiful skin. With service built around courtesy, dignity, and respect, Mayo-trained Dr. Charles Crutchfield personally treats each patient and is acknowledged as one of the nation's best physicians. True Stone Financial, with locations in Minnesota and Wisconsin, has proudly served as members since 1939. True Stone engages, educates, and supports its members to ensure they have the tools to empower their financial well-being. True Stone Financial, your neighborhood credit union. Learn more at truestone.org. Edina Eye Physicians and Surgeons, a division of Twin Cities Eye Consultants, has proudly served the Twin Cities for more than 55 years now in seven convenient locations. Using the most advanced technology combined with human touch, Edina Eye offers comprehensive services and dedicated specialists committed to excellence with innovative procedures and expertise for the most advanced eye care. Welcome to Access to Democracy. Alan Miller with you, and we have a most unusual interview today. Uh, I've been around for 23 years on this program. I am what is known as the Alta Caca of, uh, <laughs> <laughs> of Access to Democracy. And with me today is really the fellow who's going to step in and do most of the hosting and producing along with Sharon. Uh, from here on out, and he just came back from Poland, Ukraine. Uh, Steve Francisco, who, who's got an incredible resume. I mean, he's got a political science and a law degree from the University of Minnesota. Uh, he was with Sun Country Airlines. He's been a, with a bunch of nonprofits. Uh, he was a staffer to a United States congressman. And on the seventh day, he rested. But, uh, <laughs> but Steve, in April, as a humanitarian gesture on his own dime, volunteered and went to help the refugees in the Ukraine. And Steve, it's just a pleasure not only to have you as part of Access to Democracy, but really to have you here and interview you uh, in this regard. Thank you, Alan. You know, that resume, uh, what that tells people is I just can't hold a job down. Well. But um, in reality, I've had a lot of different interests. I've been very fortunate in my career and uh, thankful for the <coughs> job opportunities. And a lot I've of had. people have been very fortunate to have you there also, as we are Thank now, uh, as we pass the mantle. Uh, now, what prompted you? to pick up on your own dime, as I said, and head for Poland and the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. My wife Bonnie and I have good friends of ours named Mike, Mike and Angelica Foley, who used to live here in Minneapolis, but um, a few years ago they moved back to Mike's hometown of Chicago. And I was reading my emails in, I guess it was mid-March, and came across an email from Mike indicating that he was actually in southern Poland working with Ukrainian refugees. He asked for financial support. We wrote a check right away to help support the efforts of what he was doing there. And then he asked if anyone had the time and inclination to volunteer to consider coming to join him. So after talking with my wife about it, I decided to go. I'm retired. We had the means to buy the ticket, and uh, I went over. You know, I've told you that my grandfather was from Kiev. And when this war, and that's really what we have to call it, is right. a war, broke out, uh, I wanted to go, as I had done in uh, Desert Storm, I went to Israel. Right. I wanted to go, and uh, Sharon put a stop to it. Uh, she said, the only thing you could be is a hostage, <laughs> and, uh, and what can I say? So I didn't go. Right. Uh, I'm glad I did. I'd have to say, in addition to having a good fr good friends who were working there at the time, um, 
I recall watching a story on CNN in late March by the correspondent John Berman. He was interviewing a 15-year-old boy from Kharkiv in Ukraine who was describing witnessing a Russian rocket attack against uh, his neighborhood and the rocket hit his house, hit the car that his mother was in and he watched his mother burn to death in a vehicle. And I was so outraged by seeing this and other reports that I thought, I'm not a soldier, but I can go as a humanitarian volunteer with Mike and others who were there, and I'm glad I did. So what kind of work did you do with the refugees when you were over there? Well, when I got there, Mike said, be prepared to do anything. And so I went already having decided that I would do whatever they asked me to do. And uh, immediately upon arriving, I was handed a broom and a mop. Imagine something like a Target store. And I was assigned to a partner named Thomas from Thomas Duterte, who is a 46-year-old psychiatrist from Bordeaux, France. He and I were paired up. We got along great. I speak French also, so we hit it right off. He and I swept and mopped about the equivalent of a quarter of all the floor space in like a Target store. And uh, it took us the better part of uh, 8 to 12 hours to get all that done. But I was also making beds for the refugees, changing bedding, uh, helping refugees carry their luggage into the center. You know, many of the people who were arriving at Chemichel, they're dragging their suitcases or dragging plastic bags with whatever they could throw into the bags. And they were exhausted. You know, they've been, some of them have been walking and taking trains and buses to get to the border. And the town we were in was just a few miles from the Ukrainian border. Is it Chemichel? Chemichel, yes. It took me about a week to learn how to pronounce it correctly. In the Polish language, there are a lot of consonants and very few vowels. But it's pronounced Chemichel. And if you look at a map, it's in the corner, southeastern corner of Poland, right near the border, the western border of Ukraine. Now, you just didn't hop a plane and go over there. You had a pretty circuitous route to get there, so tell us how I you did, did that. Uh, well, I flew, uh, boarded a flight on the afternoon of uh, April 1st from Minneapolis-St. Paul to Amsterdam on KLM. There I met up with Mike's wife, Angelica, who had flown in simultaneously from Chicago. And then she and I flew together from Chicago to Warsaw. And in Warsaw, I rented a car and was From supposed Amsterdam to, to yeah, Warsaw. Amsterdam to Warsaw. Yeah. And in Warsaw, I was supposed to follow Mike and Angelica down a Polish highway to Chemichel. I had misunderstood the distance. I thought it was about 150 miles. I should have done better homework. It turned out to be it was 240 miles, about the equivalent of the distance from Minneapolis-St. Paul to Madison, Wisconsin. And uh, it ended up taking us pretty much all day. It was a driving snowstorm. None of the signs on the highways in Poland are in English, and I speak no Polish at all. And I got lost. And somehow, by the miracle of Google Maps and triangulation and whatever other technological uh, devices, I was able to meet up with Mike and Angelica in a town called Lublin, Poland, which is about halfway to Chemichel. Then we made our way uh, down to Chemichel. So it wasn't just the volunteering, it was a chore to get to where you were going. It was an adventure, I call it an adventure, and uh, it was full of surprises along the way. Uh, but once we got there, pretty much the very next day, despite jet lag and having traveled considerable distance, I think about 5,000 miles, uh, we went right to work the next morning. And we were putting in every day pretty much 10 to 14 hours every day working at the refugee center. And you were there for, I guess, 10 days. And then you got a real thank you on your way home as you got ready to board a flight. Right. And what was that? Well, if I'm thinking of the right one, there was a person that I had met down there who, uh, <laughs> Oh, oh, I know what you're referring to. Uh, I had to take a test before I came home from Poland and uh, had to take a COVID test to be able to re-enter the United States. And unfortunately, Surprise. I tested uh, positive for the SARS-2 variant, which is running rampant everywhere. Luckily, my symptoms were mild, but pretty much it meant I was going to be in Poland an additional week. 
I was actually at the refugee center for a week and then spent a week in a hotel in Warsaw at the airport. But I turned my hotel room into an office. I had my iPad with me and continued doing work on refugee issues, including trying to get some refugees into Minnesota here who had family or friend connections here in Minnesota. Now, uh, I know we communicated while you were over there. Mm -hmm. So uh, tell me a little bit about your uh, very expensive hotel room <laughs> that you were paying for. Well, the one I was paying for in Warsaw wasn't bad at all. It was a uh, Marriott Renaissance Hotel. We'll give them a little commercial plug here. But, um, you know, Poland is one of the least expensive countries in Europe. I had never been in Eastern Europe before. And my hotel room, I was in a really nice hotel room in a beautiful hotel. It was 75 bucks a night. Easily would have been like a $300 a night room, I think, here in the U.S. So if you have to test positive for COVID and quarantine in Warsaw, this was the That's place the you place wanted to, to be. That's the place to do it, yeah. But the work we did in Chemichel, I might add, too, I also, uh, you know, we, before you volunteer, you don't just walk in the door and say, I'm here to volunteer. They, you have to present your passport. They run a quick Interpol background check on you because they actually have had, sadly, some people, some criminals who kidnap children. They're unaccompanied minors who are arriving at these refugee centers, and sadly, a few of them have disappeared. So the Polish government has stationed police all around the perimeter of the refugee center. You get ID'd, you have to wear a band if you're a volunteer, you wear a vest. Steve, USA, English and French, language capability. So part of what I did also was helping translate for a few Ukrainians who spoke French, from translating from French to English. Uh, speaking of Poland, the Polish government has done an incredible job of taking these refugees in. That's true. I mean, we're talking about hundreds of thousands, if not more than a million already. And uh, it's about, actually, the latest figures I just saw, over 6.4 million Ukrainians have fled their country during this war, Putin's war. And well over half of those have gone to Poland, which shares the western border. Others have gone to Romania and to Moldova. Uh, Belarus is on their northern border, but I doubt that many refugees have gone there because Belarus is a puppet state of Russia. Well, some of the ones who went there were actually taken into Russia. Right, uh, kidnapped. Yes, yeah. kidnapped and taken into Russia. So uh, That's right. But uh, one of the days I was there, my friend Mike Foley uh, said to me, he said, Steve, do you actually want to go into Ukraine? And I said, well, we, will we be able to get back out into Poland if we go in? He said, oh, yeah, I've done it several times. So made sure I had my passport in hand. He and I went and bought several hundred dollars worth of chocolates and fruit and uh, lip balm and other sundry items to hand out to people that were standing in line. So we drove from Chemichel just only eight miles to a little town called Medica, Poland, which is right on the border. And we crossed into Ukraine. And uh, Mike started at one end of the line, I was at the other, and we sort of worked our way to the middle handing out these items to people and they were so grateful and if I could just share with you real quickly, there was an elderly lady, she saw me coming and she heard me speaking, and she said, Canada, Canada? And I said, no, USA. And she said, oh, America, America. And she grabbed my hand and was kissing my arm. And she said, thank you, America. I said, people in, she said, people in America care. I said, America does care. And just being there, the act of being there and helping people, it was just so mo moving to me to be able to do that. And the proof of America caring is the billions of dollars worth of armament and other things, necessaries, that we have sent uh, to the people of Ukraine. Right. Uh, now, Poland is a country that wasn't necessarily, it's, it's a NATO country. Uh, and it's a European Union country, but it wasn't necessarily on that really friendly terms with the United States. Uh, if anything, Putin changed that. Putin turned it into really a strong ally of ours. 
as is now is happening in Finland and it looks like Sweden also, right. uh, which were neutral countries for years and years and years. I think there's no doubt that Vladimir Putin and Russia have miscalculated horribly by launching this war of aggression, invading a peaceful neighbor. And, you know, for Putin to say, well, you know, NATO is surrounding us or America's planning to attack us, that's all nonsense. In the entire existence of NATO, NATO has never aggressively invaded another country. But you can cite numerous examples of the old Soviet Union and Putin's Russia. You know, the Soviet Union went into Hungary in 1956, Czechoslovakia in 68. Under Putin, they went after Georgia, they went after Crimea. the Crimea and now going after Ukraine. So, you know, this view of his that we have a right to create this perimeter by invading our neighbors like Ukraine, it's just not defensible, well, it's totally he, he's illegal. He's a Trump-like autocrat and unfortunately doesn't listen to other people. And the result is that instead of doing damage and driving these people away from us or annexing the Ukraine, mm -hmm. uh, he's brought a lot of us closer and recognize the fact that he is, as he has been characterized by the president, a war criminal. Yeah, that's the very thing he didn't want to happen, by the way, which was for the EU, European Union, and NATO to come closer together. And as you pointed out, uh, it looks as if uh, Finland is about to join NATO and Sweden may well be next. And I heard the Finnish president was on TV the other day. He said, well, how has it come to this point? And he said, Putin, you did this your invasion of Ukraine, you did this. This is what has prompted us to want the security umbrella of being a member of NATO. Finland shares an 800 mile long border with Russia. And so they know very well what's at stake here. NATO is a defensive organization. Uh, and what they're pledged to do is defend their members. Right. Uh, but as you said, they have never launched an attack they have never done what Putin is, is trying to do, uh, which is restore the old Soviet Union uh, as these countries break away and some of them move to democracy, well, some as have, Ukraine has done. Some have even suggested he's not even trying to restore the old Soviet Union. He's trying to restore czarist Russia under, you know, Alexander or Nicholas the Great or somebody. I don't know about that, but whatever his motivation is, you know, there's no end in sight in this war right now. And I think, as you referred to earlier, the U.S. has spent a tremendous amount of money here because look at what's at stake, the security of all of Western Europe and ultimately the security of North America, the U.S. and Canada, is potentially at stake if we have an aggressive foreign policy where Putin just invades countries at will with no consequences. And sadly, even under Putin, we saw he went into um, Syria a few years ago back, backing the murderous Assad regime and really paid no consequences for that. Speaking of murderous, the only thing that they have accomplished in Ukraine, they have destroyed cities and towns, they have killed what is now probably thousands of people, and they have accomplished nothing except turning the world against them except for a few autocratic countries. And uh, it's very sad. It is. You know, while I was in, um, in Poland, the news broke about the war crimes committed at Bucha in Ukraine. And uh, many of the refugees had not heard the news, but those of us who had our cell phones, I was checking the Washington Post and New York Times and CNN and keeping up on the news as best I could. And the word spread very quickly among the volunteers, and it was devastating to see these reports of civilians being gunned down in the streets in their own yards and in the backyards of their own homes. There's no doubt that a massive number of war crimes have been committed. But you know, I've observed to a couple of people that I know, I said, you know, this is gonna be the most well-documented war in history because practically everybody has a cell phone. They have enormous volume of recordings, an enormous number of recordings, video, just of it, the people who have done this. Just end, if he would just recognize the fact that they're not going to win, uh, they've already lost, I understand, 20,000 uh, Russian soldiers. 
I mean, it's just pointless. But my friend Angelica, who I worked with, which I think I mentioned she was originally from the old Soviet Union, and very anti-Putin and this whole expedition, but she has friends still in Russia, and she's no longer friends with some of them, that they are totally buying the line put out by Putin and the Russian government that they had to do this, that these are Nazis in Ukraine in a country where the president, Vladimir Zelensky, is Jewish and lost relatives in, in the, the Holocaust. Holocaust. And you know, his so own, it's his own family. The, but right. these, these ludicrous lies that Putin and the Russians keep propagating are just, it's really sad. Now, one of the, the things uh, that you mentioned that was interesting to me is the fact that you met all these volunteers mm -hmm. and you even met some Minnesotans there. I did indeed. I'm glad you brought that up. I was uh, walking through the refugee center one day and I had on my Minnesota Gophers sweatshirt, University of Minnesota alum that I am, and all of a sudden this woman runs up to me and gives me a big bear hug. And I said, oh, you're from Minnesota? She says, yes, Apple Valley. She was working with my friend Angelica in the healthcare clinic at the refugee center. She's a medical student at the University of Minnesota Medical School. Plus, I met two firefighters from Maple Grove, Minnesota, who did what I did, couldn't stand watching the atrocities anymore. They hopped a plane and went and volunteered at the refugee center. And uh, there were a couple of others I met, too. But in addition to the Minnesotans, just a great showing from other parts of the U.S. I met Mormon missionaries who were there doing work from Utah. I met people from North Carolina, Florida, Wisconsin, Colorado, multiple people from Chicago and New York, and uh, just a tremendous outpouring of support for the refugees among the volunteers. And the refugees are being resettled little by little, right. uh, really, in many countries, including this one, uh, all over the world, all over the free world. You know, this is an interesting situation, which I'm not sure how many of our viewers are aware of this, but most of the Ukrainians who are fleeing, they don't see themselves as refugees. They don't want to be described that way because what they anticipate is defeating Russia they and going go home, back. They right. want to go home yes. and they want to rebuild their homes and rebuild their country. As any of us would want to do. And what we saw happening while I was in uh, Poland was actually there was two-way traffic at the border. They weren't all just coming out. Some of them, when the fighting died down in western Ukraine near Lviv, which is like 50 miles away, they were crossing back. But then there were more rocket attacks in Lviv, which every time there were Russian attacks in Lviv 50 miles away, we would see a surge of refugees coming back into Poland. And as you mentioned, Poland has taken most of the people, but they've gone all over Western Europe. A few who have family or sponsors here in the U.S. have made it to the U.S. too. Now, uh, one of the things that you have done is <clears throat> not only worked with nonprofits, and I want to spend some time on this, and we don't have that much time left, mm -hmm. but you have been instrumental in setting up a new nonprofit. Reach out with U.S. Reach out with us. With yeah. us. Dot, dot com. Well, it's actually my friend Mike Foley and his wife Angelica who created this. I've agreed to be part of the board of directors of this new organization. We just had our first board meeting. And what we're attempting to do, Alan, is to fit into a niche to provide services that the other nonprofits may not be doing. The service we've identified where we think we can be helpful is chartering buses and transportation to get people from the refugee center to other destinations in Europe where they can be resettled. And so that's what we're doing right now. And uh, I'm proud to be a part of that effort. Reachoutwithus.com. Dot com, right. Now, <clears throat> getting fed was a problem while you were there. But there's a fellow by the name of Jose Andres uh, who is all over the world. A heroic uh, man. He, he's the founder, the chef. the founder of World Central Kitchen, which has numerous operations going on in Ukraine during this war, but also in Poland. And they were in the refugee center where I worked. They fed all of the refugees every day. The kitchen was open 24-7, and they fed all of the volunteers, myself included. 
By the way, they make a delicious borscht there, if you've ever had borscht. Well, that's Sharon's province. Sort borscht, of a, but, a uh, stew that they enjoy yeah. there in that part of the world, but yeah. uh, they're doing tremendous work. Now, I know when you were there, one of his kitchens was hit by a rocket. Yeah. Five, fortunately, n nobody was killed, but five were injured. And you told me that he had set up another right. kitchen to replace it within a day. Right. The attack actually happened, I think, a few days after I was back in the U.S., but I had read on the news in, I believe it was Kharkiv, mm -hmm. where this Russian rocket attack demolished the kitchen. And yeah, he was up and running again within a matter of a day, continuing their work, doing really heroic work there. Now, mention some of the organizations, if people want to make donations. Right. Uh, and I know there is a Jewish organization called HIAS, H-I-A-S, mm -hmm. and uh, they've already hit me up, and uh, right. some of the others, but there's the Red Cross. There's uh, International Red Cross is there. Uh, also, I would mention uh, UNICEF, the United Nation uh, International Children's Education Fund. They're doing tremendous work there. The organization CARE is delivering uh, aid to the refugees there. And uh, there are numerous organizations, so if one goes online and looks for a credible nonprofit, I'm sure you won't have trouble coming up with a lengthy list. World Central Kitchen is also another one which will certainly yes. gladly take your donations right. because they're feeding these hundreds of thousands of people. Yeah, and, and there's no doubt, you know, these groups are well established and are doing good work there, so bravo. We've actually run to the last minute of our interview, but share with the viewing audience some of your thoughts as we go off the air here. I just hope and pray that this war comes to an end very soon. Uh, there's been far too much uh, uh, killing and death, Ukrainian suffering, but also Russian suffering. You know, it's, uh, they're the aggressor in this situation, but that can't be much comfort to the families of their their loved ones who've been lost in this war too, the soldiers. So I hope that they find a way uh, to get back to peace and that Ukraine can be rebuilt. But in the meantime, we have to stay strong and united. America has to stand behind Ukraine and help the Ukrainian people in the face of this assault. And we have been talking with our own guest host producer, now host, uh, and Steve world traveler. Francisco, the <laughs> world traveler, and uh, obviously we know he can clean up a kitchen now and uh, mop a floor. Uh, very proud to have you on the show and uh, be handing over the mantle to you as well. Alan Miller signing off for Access to Democracy. Oh, we go over.